this is actually a pretty exciting meetup. Uh, Will has brought some uh, nice looking recording equipment, so hopefully we can get these up on uh, the web for posterity. Uh, so I'll also try to repeat questions, and if I forget to do that, maybe <coughs> remind me. So my name is Steven, and I am the founder and principal consultant at a company called Qualmente and we guide teams to AWS securely and at scale. So glad to see a lot of AWS peeps here. Uh, and one of the things I was really interested in doing with this presentation and this talk is to do some research around all the different clouds uh, since my experience in particular is, is really have been focused on AWS. So been in the field quite a quite a while, more than 15 years. Uh, it's probably closer to 20 than 15. Um, building like highly scalable, highly available stuff, and the last uh, three to four years, containerizing those workloads and now deploying them into cloud and and you know some of them very secure things. So that sounds uh, like what you do or what you're trying to do and you want some help, let me know. So let's start with like what is the cloud? And this is the only cloud picture I have in here, so don't fret too much. And for the purposes of this discussion, I want to call it a set of managed computing services backed by uh, vast, hopefully, resources and made available via API and build in small increments. And these are, <coughs> All f these are all critical pieces uh, of really the equation. You know, we don't have uh, applications. We're, we're moving out of a world where applications are able to use resources without anybody uh, uh, kind of keeping track of what it is that they're using or being able to apportion those things. And this is actually really good, uh, or can be really good. In, if we use it to do things like help understand what is the most valuable thing that our business is doing and help us understand what our margins are and, and be able to uh, get to good solutions quicker. But at any rate, um, manage, manage computing services and platforms. And I'll start by saying the cloud is like your existing data centers in that you have nearly full control over the network the machines and the data in it, at least with the cloud platforms I'm going to be talking about tonight. There are many cloud platforms out there, it, uh, but AWS, Amazon Web Services, uh, Google Compute Platform, and Microsoft Azure are the biggest by far. Uh, and of those, AWS dwarfs all the rest. Uh, I don't know what the numbers are exactly, uh, I think, but it's, it's on the other order of like, they have essentially like 70% of the market or something. Um, <clears throat> and your, your data center, of course, already has a whole bunch of services at various layers in the stack. So like raw compute, raw storage, uh, maybe you have a VMware or vSphere cluster that is providing some of these things for you. Maybe you're not. Maybe uh, you call someone um, or send a, a Slack to you know, someone in the data center to go uh, provision a machine for you or something. Maybe you're that person. Um, but then there's also uh, more specialized infrastructure, so databases, queues, uh, load balancers uh, that in many cases are uh, intended for shared usage by applications. So you have many applications joining in to a single load balancer. Uh, you have many applications using a single database server, and maybe they have different schemas, um, or but they're running on the same hardware for a number of reasons, oftentimes licensing. Um, which is a pretty shoddy reason uh, when things are down because you don't have proper fault partitioning um, and some, something used too many resources. But, uh, and then you have like fully managed app like applications. Maybe, they can, maybe you have a data stacks Hadoop, Hadoop cluster. Um, 
actually. And one of the differences with the cloud is that you have all those things, except you also have the ability to at least more easily create a self-service model. So you can apportion privileges out uh, in the world uh, pretty, pretty easily. So it, it may take weeks, it may even take months to come up with a self-service system in the cloud. But how many people have a self-service system for deploying all the kinds of infrastructure that are in your company right now? Like, anybody? Does anybody have a self-service infrastructure provisioning system? Like, four workloads? OK, yeah. So you can do this. Like, this is, this is a possibility. It happens on uh, virtually all of my client projects. Um, like people are able to declare basically what you know they're able to describe what their application needs, and uh, voila, there's a pipeline that instantiates that somehow, right? And those pipelines look different uh, depending on the forces within an organization. But the fact is, is like now we have automatically provisioning infrastructure, and like this is amazing. Like if you've, it, I audited uh, the process for provisioning. Uh, infrastructure at a former one of my former employers and it used to take between six and twelve weeks to stand up a new pool and they all looked basically the same um, and can you just just imagine or I mean I'm, I'm sure you can't imagine the variance like some your, your servers will be around sometime between six and twelve weeks from now like how can you plan around that right like <laughs> That's maddening. Um, the processes in the cloud uh, are all manageable via an API or a self-service console. So we're not talking about uh, following up through JIRA or email or whatever anymore. Like those are not APIs, uh, not really. Um, and so the clouds, all the, all the clouds provide first class APIs. Uh, are they all easy to use? No. But they exist. And so we can build up ecosystems of reusable solutions around them, which is really important. Uh, and then the limits within the cloud. So I talked about vast resources being available in the cloud. Um, the limits of the cloud are generally much higher than what you have in your own data center. Uh, they're not entirely limitless. Like I have certainly been on projects where we run uh, AWS out of a certain type of instance type in a certain data center. Um, but OK, there's other instance types and other instance families that we can use. And then we, you know, when we do that, uh, we drop AWS a note and say, hey, could you please add more uh, M4 or 10x larges or whatever it is. Um, and e even more importantly, th the limits I'm talking about here are on Things like what are the rate, what are, what are the rates that like S3 can support? Uh, those are pretty well defined, um, at least out of the box. And then you can ask for increases uh, if you need them. <laughs> it depends on the cloud, but some some of these things will adjust automatically. Some of them you make an explicit limit request increase because it's related to cost. So so you pay for what you consume. So. <clears throat> I wanted to touch on some <coughs> principles of building for the cloud. And so uh, I'm going to appeal to authority a little bit here. Uh, and I will, I will just take a screenshot, uh, or actually a photo from Twitter of Adrian Cockcroft talking last week um, at, I forget which, con oh yeah, a uh, at AWS Transformation in Paris. And so some of the principles of being cloud native are to adopt approaches where you're paying for things as you go, instead of big, big capex is kind of the alternative. Self-service, um, you know, it shouldn't take somewhere between six and 12 weeks. My team should be, act, sh should be able to act now, um, or nearly now. Uh, we should be able to think about distributing our services globally, uh, services and data. Uh, by default, we should be able to have the choice to replicate our data to some other region uh, where it's safe from our applications 
uh, where our applications are running, like we can we can we can designate a backup region, for instance, and back it back things up there. Um, <clears throat> we can uh, achieve higher availability by deploying in more geographic locations across more types of instances, perhaps, um, and we can. Uh, achieve higher utilization by auto scaling, and we can have immutable code deployments, um, which help in improve the, the determinism of what is going on in our production environments. And so, you know, these are Adrian's uh, cloud native principles, at least of last week. And I want to marry that a bit with the, the five pillars of the AWS well architected framework, which is. You know, there's a, there are pillars around security, reliability, performance, cost optimization, and on operational excellence. So we're going to go through uh, some of this uh, today. And one of my key messages here is I really suggest if you're going to be moving things into the cloud, uh, don't just migrate them, transform them. So if you have some existing successful service, uh, it is probably uh, been wedded very carefully and you know fit exactly into the existing context of your business and your existing data centers and so forth. So there are limits within your data centers that may not be well described. Um, and most of probably what is uh, limiting you is probably historical. Um, but the cloud offers choices that you should be thinking about, uh, thinking through, and then making very strategically. So I would suggest that some reasons to adopt the cloud are to improve your actual agility, like get things done faster, um, decrease your time to market, uh, actually scale your services with increasing demand. So say you have something that you expect to be uh, twice, th that has high variations of load throughout the day, um, you know, you can spin resources up and down uh, to match that demand, uh, seasonal peaks, et cetera. You can, and we'll get, we'll get more into capacity uh, planning a little bit. But scaling your IT organization. So self-service is a way to scale your technology organization because now you're removing the bottlenecks, um, which are all those email conversations and uh, rework um, associated with like things not being quite right, uh, you know, because you know things were done manually or, or whatever it was. Um, but if you productize uh, for your organization some little aspect, uh, say an S3 bucket, um, or uh, my favorite example is probably uh, a database service like Google Cloud SQL or Amazon RDS. You can say in your organization, here's the menu of RDS options that we support. And you can pick from each of these. And so this, this really simplifies um, on two levels. One, it makes it easier for an application engineering team to choose. They can say, well, OK, well, I need a medium one because I want this particular, you know, I want a single master and I want these number of replicas. Uh, but then the database team can specialize in these three options. And that's, that's really what they need to worry about, like operationally. And of course, they need to kind of be looking forward um, at the roadmap and, and developing and like understanding how those options should be changing over time. But you can get yourself out of the one-off business uh, by allowing you know, internal teams to build um, like concise sets of services based on cloud offerings. And now they can, uh, you can go and solve business problems like I need to improve the fault tolerance by, of, of our applications by taking away or removing like a shared database cluster and having independent database clusters. And the next thing is like, well, how do I spin up like 50 database clusters? Like, well, maybe we should have like a menu of three options that people can pick from. Um, so that's what I mean by scaling your technology organization. Do you have a preferred way to limit the options, or like, three? The entire menu, right? I mean, like, look at look at successful marketing pages, yeah. right? Like, you probably want an odd number, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, and that's that's a little glib, uh, but like, 
I would, I would actually, my, my less glib answer, the question was is how do you limit those options? And my less glib, more professional answer is, well, think about the architectural patterns you want to enable very explicitly in your, your organization. Like I want <clears throat> your, your, your application development organization might want to specifically support like single master, multiple readers, or multiple replicas so you can read from replicas. Um, and it, it kind of all ties into maybe what your caching strategy is for database systems and stuff like that. But like, I, I definitely don't recommend trying to uh, allow support for everything because you won't. Like, you won't support it. Like, you're not going to succeed at that. Like you want to be able to specialize and get good at something. Um, and, you know, there are going to be application teams that say, well, you know, MySQL, it doesn't work. You know, RDS MySQL or RDS uh, Aurora doesn't work for our application. It's like, well, you know, that, that's, that's interesting. Like, or like, you know, it doesn't scale or whatever. And, you know, that's a discussion to be had. But um, I think those are probably tells more around other architectural considerations. Um, and so, so really, yeah, like make that menu out of the patterns that you want to support, the patterns you want to teach. And like support and, and build up support for it in the rest of the code, in the in the in the environment. Uh, and then we can do other th you know finance sort of things like convert capex to opex, and then if you want you can convert it back to capex again, uh, and uh, design for better availability. And one of the big points here is that clouds can help you decompose. <coughs> um, and so here's a little. A uh, stack of things that clouds typically provide, a, a small set. Um, but, and this blue area is probably the, the area <coughs> that we think about most. Uh, things like, you know, what's happening with your data, what's happening with the network, your compute, um, or higher level services, perhaps like CDNs, caches, databases. Um, but there's also uh, other things in there too, and, and definitely we should be thinking about decomposing like all those things I just mentioned, but we can also really get our heads, like these are what I call the elements of the cloud, and we can, um, we have now first class objects that we can use to manipulate identity, for instance, like there's a number of, you know, a lot of organizations, and before they move to the cloud, they don't really have a good sense of identity or permissions around what's going on in their production systems. Like I am in, so I so identity and access management is a thing in all three of the clouds that we're going to talk about, and it has finer grain permissions than anything I had used before the cloud, um, which is, it's actually uh, as someone who likes. Good security, it's very exciting. Um, a lot of people think of it as painful, but, um, and it can be for sure, especially if you focus on the, the, the blue areas or the, the light blue areas instead of the dark blue areas to begin with. But you know, uh, you have the elements to do what you need. And so what I recommend doing in your first projects is really think about blowing up that system architecture and like what and start to think about like what can we offload what is the most onerous um, challenging like annoying time consuming whatever um, aspect of what we're doing now that we can offload to the cloud like lift and shift is probably at best going to produce the same result that you had in your data center, uh, because that solution was tuned to your data center. <clears throat> so while you may get there quickly, uh, you'll probably end up uh, expensive and unhappy. So I want to kind of walk through a little bit of a scenario um, to illustrate what I mean. So say you've got you know, you're the, you're the people running uh, this cool service called Instapic, uh, no relation to Instagram, and you think that it's going to, the volume is going to double uh, this year, but 
you've got this, this bit of a problem. So this is, this is a, uh, what's called a Wardley map. And on the x-axis is uh, kind of the, <coughs> where your technology that supports your customer facing service, uh, that provides value to them in some way, like where your technology fits in terms of like, it's completely custom, like we got patents when we were developing this thing, um, or the patents are still in progress because it takes like seven years or something. Uh, and then, or we have like, relatively custom solutions here um, that you know, implement like a large file store, uh, a large blob file store, um, to something that like we're using software as a service to pure commodity, um, you know, cloud blob storage. So if we, as someone who's kind of helped build a couple systems that uh, accept blobs, I know that one of the most challenging things here is to have an upload service that actually scales. So now one of the natural things to think about is like, well, okay, we're gonna, we'll probably, and, and, and one of our problems, our business problem here is that we have a filer, our NetApp filer is at capacity. And so we're faced with like buying a new one and then probably architecting such that we can like know where to find the right things because we currently have one and now we need two or N. Um, and so like, you know, there's gonna be engineering effort associated with this, and like, so what are we gonna do? Uh, so, what we might do is we might get rid, we might change our application entirely to we're gonna have something, instead of uploading through a thing called an upload service and have code that, that we own that does that, well, this is actually an interesting example where maybe our API service can do things like ret return a signed URL, a, a client will say, hey, I want to upload an image. It's super dope. It's like me and a celebrity. Uh, and I want to, I, I need to share this. So I say, hey, API server, give me a URL that I can upload this image to. And that URL happens to be an S3 endpoint. Um, and now my client is able to upload directly to S3. And maybe through, and it's not depicted here, but we could maybe, if we needed a down sample of that image, we could have little life cycle and event hooks, um, you know, basically generating smaller images, and then now they can render through here. And so this is an example of what I mean by really thinking through the transformation case. Like, the upload service in Instapix, uh, uh, in this Instapix example, is probably the most challenging service at the company. But you like you like you wouldn't recognize it. Like you would think like from a customer value perspective, it's like the cool filters or whatever that happen up in the UI. But but definitely uh, this upload service is the hardest thing to scale um, when you know there's like a big event going on or something, right? So <clears throat> what one of the things I like about Wordly Maps and especially the this sort of animation is you can like see visually. Um, the transformation in the, in the architecture. So I like to think about, when I'm thinking about architecture these days, uh, I like to think about like, well, what can I offload to the cloud and like, um, how can I move things from the left side to the right side? Where presumably they are cheaper and more scalable and not so much my problem. Any questions on that? Because this exercise can be played out for essentially every application and every potential, you know, every, every of the hundred, say, services that AWS or GCP or Azure offers. But in particular, for like the core services around like object storage, um, auto scaling, stuff like that. Okay, so, and if, and I, I went ahead and rated myself on how we did with the uh, well architected framework, and we ticked off like all the boxes, you know, depending on, um, I, I think the rely, like, I think most of these boxes are pretty easy. Um, security, you do, of course, have to make sure that you don't have an open bucket, right? Like, you don't, don't have your buckets readable, right? They're infinitely scalable and super awesome and stuff like that, but you do need to make sure that you're th really thinking about security the whole way through. But the rest of these, I think, are a pretty easy win 
for our scenario over like a NetApp filer. And I get to eliminate an entire service, like probably my most challenging one to engineer. Okay. So here's another version of the stack that we saw earlier. And these are the layers of uh, cloud architecture. And so well, what I will suggest is that you start down at this, um, this, the set of layers that people probably don't think about too much until their stuff is baked in a way that is painful to fix. So I'm, and I'm, what I'm talking about is uh, how do you structure your, your cloud deployments logically and partition things so that you um, are you know, located by your customers or near your existing data so the speed of light is not changing. Uh, and you know, co-location or like being close to your data matters, um, and, and especially if you're migrating, you want to be as close to. You know, you have to do this math about like where you want to be, um, and then also partitioning up your data, or sorry, partitioning up your accounts so that you have the right uh, access levels in each, and you can do the, you can support the right use cases in each of them, um, but not get yourself in trouble, and. You know, have the right security foundation uh, before getting too far and trying to scale up to too much of the organization. Um, and then we get into the usage of the resources that really depend on your strategy, uh, which are, you know, what I'm going to take, what elements am I going to take and like use to address my biggest business problems. And what I would suggest is probably starting, it's, it's, it's really common, I think, to start at this data layer, um, growing businesses in particular, like their fundamental constraint is often scaling their data layer. Um, so you can, you, there, there are a number of tricks here. Uh, number one, like S3 is an, is S3 and SQS, uh, so it's like blob, object storage, and um, messaging via something like simple queue service or uh, Google PubSub. Um, are common first targets to like help um, scale large workloads because especially on the messaging side, you can introduce uh, workers like background workers, so you can like uh, uh, queue work to be done performed asynchronously. So that's a common, very common. Going back to like what patterns should you support? Like, well, we want to support async worker patterns, and so giving people an easy way to adopt that. Um, can also relieve a lot of pressure on your existing uh, resources and applications and buy you time to perform a migration. Um, and then <clears throat> like once you're kind of comfortable and um, with using some of whatever you've done in the POC, which will help flush out what's going on, especially in your identity and permissions and stuff like that, you'll probably be on Rev2 by the time of, of your security approach before you are fully happy with what has gone on in your POCs or your first projects, See, and, and Jonathan is shaking his head yes, <laughs> um, that like now you're ready to start scaling out to other parts of your organization. And like you can really start thinking about, well, am I going to be doing compute in the cloud, or am I going to be um, like, am I going to be running it myself, or what? Um, <clears throat> and Pause for a moment, like, if we look at, if we jump back to this slide, I, I don't know, there's, there's probably 30 services or something listed here. Um, who considers them a full, themselves a full stack engineer? <laughs> like, you would be comfortable, and, and are you comfortable working in all of these services? Right? And, and I ask the question because, like, I'm glad you raised your hand. I'm going to raise my hand, too. Like, Jeff is raising his hand. There are people out there, uh, and I consider myself one of them, that are close to probably what people generally think of as a full stack engineer. And I assure you, I do not understand everything on this table, <laughs> right? Um, and it's going to take a team to do this and some collaboration. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and the team may be bigger than you think, right? Like it may, 
Like you may have a person associated with you know, each of these, right? That, that could be your first you know, pilot you know, platform team or something, right? That's helping you know, make a foray into the cloud. But it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. And the reason like, like we're able to really call it out, because like, gosh, we have an APIs. We, like, we have all these APIs. We have, all the, we have names for all these things now. Um, and they're kind of in one uh, gigantic sort of sprawling set of documentation at a, at a cloud vendor, um, whereas we previously just used email and wikis, right? So I want to, uh, so actually before I move on, any, any questions or comments? OK. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about how, uh, hmm. I think my resolution adjusted. Um, how clouds enable you to uh, slice up your uh, business uh, and the technology that you're running into logical entities. Uh, and so there are a few things at the, sort of at the top that help you organize your cloud resources and um, you know create scopes. Uh, and in particular, uh, these kind and and you know, I've created a little table here, or we, my team has created a little table. Um, and at the at the highest level, you know things that identify all the entities or like contain all the entities. Uh, in your world are things like the organization and account, um, and then there's identities that are identified by IAM. Um, and you know, there are interesting differences here. Uh, <clears throat> I will say that this is, this is the space where I think uh, the cloud providers actually might differ the most, um, is how we organize the people, which is really interesting, um, and, and like manage all the resources, which is really interesting when you talk about like having a multi-cloud strategy, because this is actually one of the hardest things to get right, and there's pretty different models. Um, <laughs> um, but I would say that the, the part that is probably most similar across all of them is that there's always a policy that you can define that specifies access to certain objects. And I'll show, uh, let's see. Actually. You can show where you validate the policy before you come in first. What's that? Always validate your policy. I that I mean, you just run it, right? Just kidding. So this is so this is a very simple policy. <clears throat> this is what I mean by policy. That um, this policy is enabling a service, or it's actually uh, let's see. We are disallowing a service to put objects into the specified bucket. Uh, so I guess actually this, this policy is kind of interesting. We deny some stuff first, and then we enable basically everything else on the S3 interface. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's actually this policy is a little bit difficult to read in that uh, Although we do have some, some nice names here, uh, so we can, we can say, like, unless the object is going to be encrypted, don't allow the method uh, to be invoked. Um, and if it's not going over a secure transport, also you know, deny that. But other than that, go ahead and allow whatever's you know, the principle here. Um,
to put things into the bucket. And so this is like one policy, and you'll have you know, thousands, potentially, depending on the size of your organization. Um, but all of the cloud providers support some uh, method for defining policies. And uh, here's an example of on Google Cloud Platform, there's this notion of an organization. Like this is the full resource hierarchy, they call it. Uh, See, so there's this organization, which is typically uh, tied to the organization's G Suite. Doesn't have to be, but it typically is. And then there's these thing called folders and projects, and um, these are essentially ways to organize people, at least at the folder level. Um, and then uh, you have resources at the very bottom, and there are some resources that will belong completely to a project, uh, and there are other resources that can actually be shared amongst projects, like VPC networks. Um, but what I want to kind of illustrate here, and I think, I think the, the Google Cloud documentation actually does a pretty good job about it, is that we should probably think about what this structure is going to look like before we get too far, um, if we want to have uh, the hope of it actually working for us in a reasonable, reasonably long term. The biggest cloud anti-pattern is like, oh, we have an account that has everything in it. And the problem with that is typically like you're not going to have um, proper access control. Um, you can try to retrofit something uh, based on like tags or fancy IAM policies or whatever. Um, but guess what? It, it, like you're engineering this yourself, and it's going to be an engineering burden, um, and it's probably not going to work very well. Uh, and one accident can potentially destroy everything. Uh, and, and this is like. A real problem when you have weak isolation between environments because you want uh, people to have more access to do things in development than and then, and then decreasing access like through stage and production um, and you know I, I've seen a couple projects that have tried to migrate away from this approach like we're like we're migrating you know some startup that was acquired and the acquiring company then literally spends months um, like trying to get resources that you know maybe operating in production basically migrated somewhere better um, because now they actually have an auditor who cares about like whether or not the HIPAA data is available to everyone uh, in the company. So here is one such like. Uh, formation of many that you might see out in the wild, but basically using in the AWS world, using something like if this is my AWS organization where all my accounts uh, can belong uh, to my, my AWS organization, um, then I can have, uh, it's a common pattern to have a billing account um, that is essentially the root, the root account associated with the organization and like all the billing roles up there. It's also really good from a finance point of view if you're going to be buying reserved instances because you buy them up here and then all the fancy math gets applied up here um, and consolidates uh, your reserved instance usage across all your accounts. Uh, if you, you know, there are certain patterns to like solving uh, identity and access management problems around like I have like there's only there's only one of me at least at a particular uh, at least in the context bounded by a company, right? Um, but I need to have varying levels of access uh, in different accounts, and so there are patterns that you can use uh, with trusted accounts, uh, where sorry, where <clears throat> say your production stage and development accounts and, and sandbox accounts they're all trusting this other account to like vend identity and, and say, yes, this person can assume this particular role and with that role they get these permissions and they can do all kinds of things. Um, and those things are different by account. So this is, this is one pattern. Uh, there's another pattern involving identity providers which we're not going to go into. But the main thing is that like these pictures are very different. 
Um, and this, this picture looks a little more like that uh, Google Cloud Platform picture. Yes? Do you find that uh, large enterprises tend to work a little bit easier with Azure as a design pattern because Active Directory is so prevalent in large orgs and they have Active Directory in, in the cloud on Azure? I mean, do, they, do they simplify this type of thing? I know you're next to me that is on the Azure, but yeah. just for a hot take. Yeah, so the first hot take is I'm really looking for an organization who really wants to do things with Azure, okay. uh, number one, um, <clears throat> or looking to talk with them in depth, let's say, um, and understand why they're interested in Azure. Um, but I think that, so there's definitely lots of ways to uh, federate your Active Directory uh, that, is, that you're currently using to organize uh, things either into the cloud or use it basically underneath uh, the identity provisioning, or sorry, the identity uh, provider um, uh, integration that you can enable with AWS or with other cloud options um, to like be in charge of saying yes, this is Steven, uh, and you you know. Here's here the here are the roles that they're allowed to have, and there's lots. There's actually a number of products in that space. Um, yes. So in my experience, uh, any company who's large enough and serious enough to want to use AD as the as the backbone, like that is probably the last thing that they will ever expose to any third party service directly. So it's kind of like. While they might be familiar with the concepts and say, well, we, we run our own internally, it's, it's, it's easy for us to make a cognitive jump to one that's in the cloud. Um, it's not something that most that I've interacted with are, would ever even begin to entertain a direct integration with. Not even with Microsoft itself? Absolutely not Microsoft itself. Absolutely. Probably that last. Uh, just because you're, you're talking about something that's probably the most, that is the keys to the literal thing that I'm right? So, yeah. I mean, so, so I've, I've seen uh, clients put read-only uh, directory replicas out into the cloud because, you know, they want to have, uh, say, DNS also manage. Like, they, they want to have all of the hosts in their environment have an appropriate name secured by DNSSEC. Uh, and so they're using Active Directory for that, amongst other things. Um, and then you can, you can, what you can do is you can put those replicas out in the cloud. But like, and there, there's a few patterns here, um, at least I know for AWS. Uh, and then with like Azure, every, Every uh, subscription uh, has to have an, uh, an Active Directory associated with it. By default, that is an Azure AD. And I'll be honest, I don't know enough about like, all of the peering federation stuff to speak much more about it. Video, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, but definitely, you want to have, like if you're, if you're going to be running up to an organization with, say, 100 people, you definitely need to have some good solution around what, how to manage your identities and how to associate roles with those people and, and keep those in uh, check. That, that like these are actually doing reasonable things instead of like every time someone runs into a problem, you say like, well, service colon star. That's what they get, right? <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, and structure your trust relationships in, in such a way that things only flow out to the cloud, and like you can have like a separate AD domain for your cloud deployments and stuff like that. So, uh, okay, 
So after identity and like account, which is going to, so again, the, the, your accounts or subscriptions or your uh, project in the Google world are going to be the fundamental thing, your fundamental fart par fault partitions, and uh, which are gonna limit your blast radius and your audit scopes. So you wanna make sure that you're not mixing data classifications and stuff like that. Um, and make sure that people have the right set of permissions for each of those, in each of those different sort of logical boundaries. Uh, and then the next big thing is actually we start to get into runtime stuff, like real runtime stuff, which like, okay, the notion of a region where, uh, so a region is a physical area where data centers are located and linked uh, by a, a low latency, the data centers within them are linked by a low latency network. So typically less than 10 milliseconds. Uh, in practice, uh, and lower than that, like they so data centers within a region, uh, like the targets uh, are like sub five milliseconds, really between instances, um, and the different providers have uh, pretty significantly different uh, numbers of regions. Um, and AWS, you know, well, I guess Azure has more than twice as many points of presence or regions around the globe, which is actually, I think, part of their strategy. Um, and so, you know, depending on the business problem you're trying to solve, like if you're trying to locate, like relocate, like internal uh, services uh, for your company, like, well, maybe that makes sense to put them in Azure and like, you know, you're already on Microsoft stack for all that stuff, like fine, just push it towards them and pick a region that's nearby, right? Um, however, if you're talking about like customer facing services, like, well, where do your customers live? Europe, East Coast, West Coast, both, you know, is it truly global? And start thinking through that problem. And one, one thing about uh, like Azure regions, which actually I found like the best description of this in the GCP documentation, was that by design, Azure, Azure so Azure has some interesting like fault tolerance. Like their um, regions, most of them have a single, what they call data center in them. Uh, multiple data centers in an Azure region is actually the exception rather than the rule. And but within those regions, they have um, different fault domains. Or within that single data center, they have different fault domains for power and network. And you can use this thing called an availability set and select between them. Um, but definitely, uh, one of the things I wanted to call out here is like, you know, regions are things that are separated by hundreds of, hundreds of miles um, at a minimum. And so, the next kind of logical thing down is, a, is really a physical data center, uh, which is typically going to be uh, around like 99.9% .9 available, um, at least according to uh, my favorite AWS architect. Um, oh my goodness, I remember having trouble with his name, James Hamilton. Uh, if you've never seen James Hamilton talk, look, look him up. He's very exciting, uh, at least for me to watch. But, uh, so there's most, you can see that there's, there's quite a bit of difference in the number of data centers that uh, AWS and GCP run per region versus Azure. So there's only two regions where Azure has multiple data centers. And that's, uh, it's like US East 2 and then there's a, a region in Europe. Um, and so the, pr the primary thing to think about from a data center perspective is that these are you know, physical, physically separate uh, buildings. They have independent uh, power and network from the other uh, data centers in that region. Uh, and they're typically separated by uh, enough distance that they shouldn't be affected by, say, the same flooding, uh, hopefully. <laughs> And data, the, the data center, um, you know, typically it has a, something like the name of a zone in the name. Um, these are places where we should distribute our computing and data resources across them such that we can create 
uh, fault tolerance, like we should deploy into three data centers, uh, is a generally a good rule of, of thumb to stick with. Um, now, Azure, they actually have uh, some primitives you can use uh, that are, they have primitives that are storage specific and then compute specific to create uh, what's called an availability set to, to get back the, to get around that single data center sort of fault problem. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about self-service a little bit. And, you know, again, I didn't, I had like 30 things listed on the previous slides. ADBS currently has more than 100 services with 3,000 API method calls available. Um, it's a lot of stuff, and it covers that whole stack. And so we should really be thinking about, uh, again, what we can stop doing and push off to the cloud, what we should architect for the cloud. Uh, so we've already been through an exercise on that. Um, and so when we focus on trying to reduce time to deliver the right thing, uh, like we want to do things like transition from weeks building a business case around some new application to days building a prototype. Like become more action oriented is one thing. Uh, and then especially when it comes to like scaling, like let's avoid you know, spending weeks around uh, capacity planning and like, like long-term budgeting. Um, and, then, but, and then instead use like auto scaling to deploy right size infrastructure which leads into like this capacity model. So here's a, a visualization. <coughs> Apologize, the, it looks a little out of focus here. Um, but in the old school, like if this blue line is our actual load uh, in a statically provisioned infrastructure world, like we have to like jump in steps. And, and with the cloud, we can transform this to like a continuous, a more continuous function, right? That actually scales down. Um, OK. So yeah, the message being scale up and down with a fleet of cattle, uh, which goes hand in hand with one of the things that really you need to be able to do that is immutable or nearly immutable infrastructure um, such that you can uh, or fully automated provisioning, at least. doesn't need to be immutable necessarily. But um, being able to describe a policy for scaling up and down. And so th there's this notion of auto-scaling. Uh, and it will, number one, it will help you maintain application availability because you can set a minimum and a maximum number of uh, EC2 instances or containers or what have you. Uh, that you want running, and then it will, the system, here's a, here's a like, if you've ever done control systems before, you can kind of uh, see that we start with a signal that comes out of some metrics um, or a health check uh, and says like, okay, well, we have increasing resource utilization, that fires a little alarm, there's something that uh, listens for that alarm and reacts and says like, oh, CPU utilization is up. That means, it, and it's above 50%, which is my threshold. Uh, I will send a scale up signal. And this says like, okay, so add two instances. Uh, those get launched. When those become healthy, um, they get added to the load balancer. And the cycle, the control loop starts again. And the nice part about this is that Every cloud provider provides a high quality implementation of this control loop. Uh, and so you can, you can take advantage of that and use it um, to scale up and down your capacity. So is anybody using auto scaling? Should be, okay, good, good, all right. Uh, okay. All right, so I'm going to breeze through some network stuff. Um, so networks 
are, again, are at the foundation of the cloud architecture. Um, and they can be, if you haven't done much in the way of networking before, they can be really complicated to get going with. But again, um, once, you know, if you're a network engineer um, and you have inclinations toward code, definitely give it a shot. I think actually you'll find that all the concepts are there and, uh, or many of the concepts are there that you're already accustomed to, but now you can codify all of it and uh, express it, per, you know, depending on what you're doing in, the, in a declarative way. Um, so all major cloud providers have the notion of a virtual network that you can deploy, and you use these to define a logical and independent network to deploy your apps into and your devices into. And uh, it's typically used to isolate uh, one application or set of applications from another. And uh, for the most part, these things are free. So don't be afraid to use them. Um, you know, the more you use, of course, the more you're going to have to connect together, potentially. But they're free. Um, and they can, uh, most of them are region specific. GCP is kind of different here in that you can create global, um, globally, you can create very large virtual networks. In those virtual networks, you can create subnets uh, that help divide up and organize uh, your network into zones, just like you would be accustomed to, I think, uh, in your own data center. Uh, you can stick load balancers out at the front. Um, it is possible to run your own, lo own load balancers, but now you become responsible for scaling that traffic. Um, so think about that carefully, even if you're like an Nginx master uh, or traffic master. Um, load balancers are one of the fundamental things that clouds provide you. Uh, I think I still have it, yes. I had this sticky note uh, to in, or, or try and remind myself to uh, talk about the notion of even though uh, when you provision a load balancer in certain environments, uh, they'll say like, oh, it scales automatically, and, in, and indeed they do. Uh, GCP actually says there's scales instantly, um, which I think is, we can probably call that out as incorrect straight away, because um, nothing is ever really instant. But um, in particular, like the AWS, uh, ALBs, and ELBs, you may need to give them a call to say, hey, we're expecting some trap, I mean, not a call, an AWS case rather, uh, and say like, hey, we're expecting this kind of traffic. Can you warm up the ELB? Um, instead of having like, instead of relying on the adaptive stuff to take care of it all. Um, but one interesting thing I wanted to call out here is that uh, there are two cloud providers that support UDP at their load balancers and one that does not. So if you care about UDP, you may not want to use AWS. Like if that's like key to your business, or now you are in the game of like, if you need to actually have load balance UDP, you have to take care of that yourself, um, which can be a significant engineering investment. Uh, firewalls, so the general pattern here, okay, so firewalls permit uh, traffic in and out of managed network resources. You specify, again, a policy. Um, and I'll say the most interesting thing here is, that, well, the, the general pattern is you define the network, or sorry, the, the firewall policy at the network level. But then all of the actual uh, permission, permit or deny decisions are made locally at the network <laughs> device. So whether it's an instance or an ALB or, or sorry, a load balancer or whatever it is. So the actual decision making is scaled. So there's no central firewall device in AWS, right? That, that would not scale. And when you put all these things together, you might end up with something that looks like this. So you have within a given region, uh, I've deployed, you know, this is US West 2, Oregon. I've deployed an application operating environment and you know, these orange lines indicate availability zones. Uh, there's various subnets uh, in them that help me organize you know, the DMZ, 
the application, the data, the management uh, areas, and I can deploy different things in there and route traffic around. So that's kind of what that all uh, culminates in. So, and of course, this is all defined programmatically, and I can change the topology to be essentially whatever I want. Um, this, this design is really kind of geared towards like not scaring auditors. Um, there are simpler designs with fewer subnets that some people use, but um, you know, if you have auditors who like, who, who are very concerned about like the, the words of isolation and network segmentation in the PCI spec, um, this kind of approach tends to make them pretty happy. So any questions on what you can do with networks? Okay. All right. So compute will kind of work through. Yes, sir. <coughs> So the question was, how do you, what, what's it, what are good strategies for not tying services to an IP? And I would say tie them to a DNS name instead, right? Uh, and then you can move those around. Um, it does. So yes, there's replication time. Um, and in particular, what I, what I tend to do is like provision a C name um, that is like service.company.com um, uh, or servicedev.company.com. And I also uh, tend to find that people want to have uh, the account and region baked into the, the DNS, the, the, FQ, the fully qualified domain name as well. Um, and so a pattern I've used a couple times is basically you have some nice human readable C name that gets uh, applied to like say the load balancers uh, official public uh, or internal private uh, domain name. Uh, but you actually kind of bring up an interesting thing. So you said how do you avoid pinning services to IPs, essentially. And it's very, it's very important not to rely on, say, an ALB, like an elastic load balancer IP, because they will change. So that's all managed dynamically as part of the scaling process and fault tolerance process. So um, the, only, the thing that is stable, uh, and I, I won't go back because it's not listed, but the thing that is stable in the AWS world as a, as a way to contact a load balancer is it's is its domain name, not the IPs. Now, if you, there, all the clouds also offer uh, IPs that you can associate and disassociate with various devices. Um, I think those are typically used more for like ingress in more special cases like um, as part of a NAT gateway or a customer gateway or something like that. Um, not so much like customer traffic. Is that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and of course you could build your own reverse proxies with Elastic IPs. You just, which is you know NAT gateway essentially. Because you can like DNS run drop in your load balancer, but then you don't get region CDN. So sort of. Yeah. Say that again. So like if. I have multiple regions with load balancers for services, and mm -hmm. I want to load balance between the regions, mm -hmm. unless I have some application logic in front of that for regional CDN yep. type style. So, so the common so was... You extract, abstract, 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 and then it's like, at what point do right. you actually have the service? So I would, I would suggest that if you have deployed your service in multiple regions, uh, and you want to be able to uh, choose the proper endpoint to go to. I actually think that, that that tends to require some sort of smart client or smart DNS. Um, so you know, doing either geo IP based uh, name resolution or you know, like I'm going to call it finagle 
um, you know, the old client side load balancing kind of thing and like, like a client library that is actually smart enough to like test the responsiveness or like have information on like how things are performing or how far away things are and like make a good choice. But. And just never give anyone an IP address when they ask. <laughs> you can just give them a DNS name. Oh, yeah. It'll be here. Yeah. And that's even, it, it's not so much the idea of tying a service to one defined call, making it so the service itself is immutable. It, doesn't, it isn't in location A or location B, it's just service. Right. And then there are different philosophies for how DNS should work, especially with, you know, when you're not doing fully qualified lookups, right? And whether that is like the solution to everything or the poison of everything. Um, okay, so compute options, we're probably pretty familiar with these. Uh, what we, what I, I, so virtual machines are provide, provide customer managed compute environments. Uh, that you can instantiate from a cloud provided marketplace or customer um, managed machine image. Uh, so virtual machine, I think we're all pretty familiar with this stuff. Um, and there's a bunch of different types of instances that you can run in every one of the clouds. I was, I was a little surprised at how uh, similar they were. I, there, there's not really much in the way of differentiation other than uh, I think that you can, I mean, you can run FPGA <laughs> instances over in um, AWS. Uh, and then from a tenancy perspective, one thing that did appear to be unique to AWS and maybe GCP was that you can run dedicated uh, instances on your own dedicated virtual hosts. Um, the billing is all kind of converged to really pretty fine-grained stuff with the worst being essentially a minute. This hour is for uh, on a dedicated instance. Um, but otherwise, it's by the second now. And then containers, this is when you want to run uh, cloud-managed uh, orchestration services. Um, if you want to run, if you want someone else to run your Kubernetes cluster, which I recommend, uh, maybe get Azure or GCP to do it. Uh, they provide basically the uh, the cloud owns the management of those for you, and they give you like an upgrade command that you can decide when to run. Um, whereas, kind of, if you're going to be running containers in AWS, the thing that is native, uh, a native service is Elastic Container Service, uh, which has its own, um, its own orchestrator, the ECS orchestrator, um, which is kind of one of the nice things about it. It was one of the first uh, orchestrators that supported uh, going across availability zones. Uh, but essentially, the, the entire lifecycle of that cluster is owned by you. So you know, you, whether you choose to run Amazon ECS optimized AMIs or your own thing, it's, it's not the level of you know, management. Like you don't get the level of management support with ECS that you would with, say, uh, G, uh, like Google Container Engine. Uh, and then there's the, like the functions as a service or serverless. Uh, which, is, which are platforms for directly executing customer provided code. Um, and those platforms are integrated with other parts of the cloud, you know, whether it's security um, and particularly security and scaling. So you can get an IAM role um, for your function that you know, gives it permission to access whatever that role is allowed to access, whether that's an object store or you know, a, a queue. Um, and these are great for uh, especially reactive processes, you know, running your own applications, DevOps glue. I'm gonna be, we're gonna be writing a fair amount of DevOps glue in, in the old Lambda, uh, probably in Python. And the, I meant to bold it, but the only language that exists across the board is Node.js. 
So the future has a lot of JavaScript in it. Uh, and then moving on to object storage, as I mentioned before, you know, in the Instapic example, like object storage is probably one of the most interesting things to start playing with in that these object storage systems provide what appears to be infinite storage capacity for file objects and massive scalability for reads and writes via an HTTP API. Um, they're best for unstructured data that you don't need to see, like you don't need an index on them. Um, if you need an index and, and need to be able to query them, the data that's in them quickly, you should build that outside of the store. And what you can do is like when you upload something, like I mentioned with a downsampling thing, you could also say extract uh, EXIF metadata from that uploaded image and pump that into some other store like uh, DynamoDB or um, whatever the, um, I, for, I forget the Google equivalent. But, uh, and then these things have object, uh, as I mentioned, they have, there are various tiers for uh, storage and you can migrate objects uh, into cheaper storage, you know, um, basically from, from online to nearline to uh, retrievable within say four hours kind of stuff. Um, Again, if you're looking, if, you, if you're on this like, you know, we need to be multi-cloud provider capable, uh, be careful about like, and you're like, well, we'll just, we'll just replicate our stuffs. Um, make sure that your object sizes line up <laughs> um, across the clouds and that you choose the right things. Um, and that, you know, one of them isn't a whole lot more work than the other. And then, I'm not, I don't want to go through all the detail here uh, because we're kind of, we've been at this a, a while. But you can provision block storage, so things that uh, appear as disks uh, into your instances, into your compute instances. Um, and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, I will say that I had I and my research assistant had a lot of trouble really understanding Azure's offering around the block storage spaces. It, there's clearly a lot of them, um, a lot of different options here. And this is kind of what I mean by uh, like an instance store um, or instance level storage where there are like literal ephemeral disks that are made available by the host computer and they can be mounted into uh, an instance and made available. Um, and then these, this, these disks are also available over the network. Um, so in the Amazon world, this is called a block store. Uh, in Google, it's like a persistent disk, uh, called persistent, yeah, persistent disk. And there's different flavors. And you'll see uh, that like, there, it's actually not so much question marks, it's just that uh, for Azure, like there's this whole table of like very complicated matrix um, of, of like what performance you're gonna get, whereas it's much clearer um, with AWS and GCP like what you're gonna get or what you can expect in terms of like what my maximum sizes of uh, disk are and what throughput they're gonna have and like what IOPS uh, you need. So I didn't include IOPS on here. There's a lot of data. But like depending on your workload, you can pick the, the storage that is for you. Um, and there's a general trend away from instance level storage, uh, at least in AWS. Um, and there's a lot of instance types now that you can only launch with uh, Elastic Block Store. Um, so theoretically, the availability of EBS and, and I think these block stores that are available over the network generally is supposed to be five nines, which should be pretty, you know, it's pretty good. Uh, it, especially since these are local to a data center. Um, so like when I say availability is like within a single AZ, what I mean is that once you provision a, a disk on uh, the network block store, like you can't move that disk to another zone uh, or another region. Uh, you would have to copy it. Like you can't 
like just reattach that. Like, like it's literally sitting on probably the equivalent of a, it's on a disk array, right? And those aren't um, transferable. Okay. And yeah, so I had, we had a lot of trouble um, kind of understanding Azure managed disks. Uh, so beware, like my, if it's really important for you to like understand this stuff, I would allocate like a day, which is kind of crazy. Um, and then one of the last pillars of uh, the AWS well-architected framework is really around your operational uh, hygiene. And I will suggest that managing your infrastructure as code is super important at um, past POC scale at, at a minimum. Like I do it for POCs, like I'm helping someone with a POC today, I wrote some code for that. Um, but all the clouds, they have uh, some means that is native to them for expressing uh, infrastructure resources as code. Uh, there's also a cross-platform tool called Terraform, um, which at least provides you a language that is that you can use across many clouds and many providers and stuff like this of not just cloud stuff, but um, like there's like 40, I think, plus providers now for things like DNS and CDNs and stuff like that. But if you are in the position where you're going and provisioning and managing infrastructure like via a console, like via a web browser, like what you see in a lot of demos and like what the, you know, technical sales people will come and like do oftentimes for your um, management uh, folks, uh, that's a big no-no, like it doesn't scale. Like, and you'll end up um, uh, like with a lot of uh, probably mistakes. And at a minimum, you're missing things like version control. You're also missing things like the ability to test and promote uh, infrastructure from one environment to another. Um, so this is like super important. Do at least some element of it. Uh, if you wanna learn like how to like really go for it with Terraform, let me know, I can help you with that. Um, auditing is a first class service <laughs> in these clouds. Like, you know, if you think about all the expense and, and effort spent on like auditing and like inspecting things in existing data sources, d data centers, like this is, like this is worth, you know, like CloudTrail and the config service are worth two very large teams in most organizations. <laughs> Like because they provide you know automated and um, you know third party managed like accounts of what resources are being provisioned, um, what what what's out there, and what are people doing with them. Uh, so like they're on the other side of a trust boundary um, that like is essentially inviolable, uh, which is which is awesome and really like auditors love it. Um, you can make friends with your CISO with this stuff. So go forth and show them. So uh, summing up, like what I wanna suggest is that you architect for the cloud, like actually like dig into some of these services, figure out what provides the most business value to like move the business um, and <clears throat> shift unwanted responsibilities, like act, act strategically with what you're doing uh, and like, like you know, spinning up a bunch of instances, it looks great in demos and like, oh look, we've got traffic uh, and stuff like this. But it's often not like really where the hard problem is. Um, and you know, sometimes it is, but often it's, it's around data. Uh, so I suggest kind of peeking under those covers. Uh, and also, before you get too far along, ensure that you're building on a solid and secure foundation. It's okay to do POCs, but like really like once you're starting to get uh, especially customer data into these things, like that's too late to go, I guess it's never really too late, but it's gonna be more expensive to go retrofit, um, like a good security model around that, and it may require a migration of data, and, and it, just gets, it just gets much more expensive. So think about that logical partitioning stuff up front, and like where data should go, and what people should have access to in each zone, um, in each domain, um, and, uh, Feel free to 
hit me up if you have any questions. That's that's it. Anybody have any questions now? Yes, sir. Talking about the infrastructure as code, can we replace uh, cloud formation with Terraform in the code pipeline in AWS? Code pipeline has several services put together, and the one of them is cloud formation. Can we just replace it with Terraform? So, code pipeline <coughs> has, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I, don't, I was going to defer to Jeff on that question. My answer is probably no. That would be my uh, guess. I mean, you can do anything you'd like, depending on how much effort you want to put in. <laughs> um, Code Pipeline has... Code Pipeline, for those who have not been read in, is a pipeline orchestration tool. Um, so it will orchestrate uh, based off of events. It will orchestrate... Um, build jobs and various deployment activities, including manual steps. Uh, they, they do a very good job of actually modeling sophisticated pipelines. Um, however, most, the, the only things they really have out of the box for deployment um, look like, I think, CloudFormation. You can use Code Deploy, which is essentially a, a CloudFormation slash Elastic Beanstalk slash sort of thing where helps you bake AMIs and deploy new AMIs in a very like, you know, pre-2010 style of deployment <coughs> where you're using VMs for isolation. Um, but, uh, but it has an actually very good uh, API for writing your own plugins. I've done that a couple times now. Um, uh, probably the most popular third party API uh, or plugin for code pipeline is actually just Jenkins. So really anything you can do with Jenkins uh, you can hook into code pipeline, but if you're sadist or masochistic enough to run your own Jenkins, you may as well just run your own Jenkins sort of thing and, and use uh, Jenkins for your pipeline engine. So it's kind of like, it's a trade-off. Um, but you use Jenkins just for people, just for one Well, some people use Jenkins for brushing their teeth. Um, like, it really any kind of... Some people do whole pipeline automations just Jenkins. based on Jenkins. I mean, it's just a shell bash script server, so do anything you want to. But um, it's also groovy. Yeah, don't you can do groovy. whatever you want. It's magic. But but you can extend code pipeline to do anything with with fairly low effort, honestly. So yeah, but I, definitely to start with, if you're going to be running. Uh, if you've got some stuff in cloud formation uh, and you're at, or you have existing skill in cloud formation, I would probably stick with cloud formation for a bit and like solve make sure the business problems get solved um, and then you know as you start to scale you may f you may find that you have uh, trouble with cloud formation um, I think that it's easier to manage large infrastructure deployments with Terraform, but opinions vary. Um, Terraform, I guess probably just me, I haven't heard of that, but is that comparable to Mesosphere? And, and you mm. So Terraform is a infrastructure as code tool that supports many different, um, it has this notion of uh, providers. And there's an AWS provider, a Google Cloud provider, and those are thin wrappers over those providers' APIs, own APIs. So one big thing about Terraform that, that I should say is that like, you can't write some Terraform code and then like get portability across clouds. Like the language is the same, the model is the same, but the way you provision a load balancer or like an ALB is specific to uh, uh, AWS and it, it's not the same as a network load balancer in Google and they don't try to pretend it is, um, which is I think refreshing in some sense um, and like lets you work directly on it, directly on the infrastructure, more or less. Uh, Mesosphere is more akin, well, it is a container orchestrator, so it's actually more belongs on that uh, container slide and is uh, a peer to something like Kubernetes for 
deploying, you can deploy services and um, so not just container services, but like Hadoop and MapReduce stuff um, out on Mesosphere. Uh, these are frameworks. But yeah, it's more of like an application level continuous orchestration tool rather than like an infrastructure orchestrator. Yeah, it sounds like Terraform's a better wrapper. Oh yeah, yeah, they're they're different. They're pretty different beasts. Okay. Yeah, like you can understand Terraform. Yeah, yeah. for one. Yeah. Yeah. Or I mean, and I I don't mean like <laughs> you. <laughs> I meant like we we can understand Terraform. <laughs> Meso Mesos is, is a very big thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. So this sort of falls in the data layer of the architecture. Yeah. And it's the least favorite thing, at least for me, to think of. But backups and data retention. So yeah. How do you model that into your cloud transition strategy? Hmm. Um, can you be a more specific? Can you, can you be, make? Can you provide a more specific use case? So like So point in time recovery, like you got your blow-off storage and great. Yeah. What happens when somebody says I want to retrieve this blob from four days ago? Great question. So the question was how do I do point in time recovery or um, how do I recreate this blob from four days ago? Uh, all of the blob storage services support versioning. They also support encryption uh, with again I'm gonna speak now from AWS side, you can encrypt with like an account-wide uh, key that is just there by default. You can uh, encrypt with keys that are managed by KMS. You can encrypt with your own key. Um, so depending on what kind of comfort level your CISO has with uh, your cloud's like key managers, um, you can choose the thing that's right for you. Uh, but definitely the versioning, like. The, so it's particularly in AWS, versioning is essentially free um, in that you only pay for additional versions, like the this, this, uh, space occupied by additional versions. So one of the, one of the places that actually we, I use it most is on Terraform state files. And so we can actually go and see, so every time we run, we apply Terraform code and have Terraform make changes, the, the state that Terraform um, ended up in, or ended up instantiating, um, and the relationship between all the objects, that gets persisted to an S3 bucket, that object is versioned, and we've gone back and tried to figure out like, like when we've encountered a problem with something. We've actually gone and like looked through like, oh well, and done a diff. And like, oh, well, we ran into the, some, some real problem once like GM this version back. <laughs> um, like, we've done that before. Um, and so, you know, for, for object storage, it's actually, I think, a pretty easy story. They all support versioning. Um, you can do cross-account replication uh, for your services. Uh, Amazon just released a thing like this past week, I think, where you can replicate a cross region into another account and take revoke permissions from the source account so that if they go in crazy and delete everything, right? Like they, they actually don't have permissions to delete in, this, in the place where things were replicated to, um, which is, seems like a good idea. Um, so, you know, there's, there's feature after feature after feature in these things. For other kind of point in time recovery uh, questions, those are going to be, I mean, they're all service specific, right? So, but there are point in time recovery options for like most of the Amazon RDS databases, if not all. Certainly the ones that I care about. So, just to follow on a little bit more on the Terraform, I'm a big <coughs> Terraform guy myself. Okay. Um, I, I do drink the Kool-Aid for Jenkins, unfortunately, but for the automation, it, you just can't beat it. Yeah, what else are you going to do? I know. I mean, you're going to drink some Kool-Aid. Yes, exactly. Be Jenkins but, um, I've been playing with the Kubernetes Tectonic, and I just wanted to get some thoughts. Um, okay. I like it, but it's, you know, I'm kind of not used to having all my controls handy for doing everything from start to finish, scratch. And it's more, I'm just kind of seeing if anybody's played with it yet and see if they like it. With Tectonic? Yeah. 
So I have actually not played with it. The Jeff, have you? Uh, I kicked the tires yeah. like a year and a half ago. Uh, I was just curious to get feedback on Mattel as far as, but I'm not used to not having the granular control either, so it's a little more hands off. I mean, you get a couple keys, some SSH keys, and you're off and going, and you can deploy to your cluster. Right. So, or your I mean, I would suggest at the at the rate that Kubernetes changes, that that's yeah. how you want it. Yeah, like, you know know. what? Here's this like super volatile stack. Like, you, you know, unless you can dedicate, unless it can be your full time job to keep up with it. Like, right. Honestly, like people yeah. I talk to, the the general guidance that I give is like, unless you have a solid million dollar budget a year. To dedicate to full-time resources to managing your custom Kubernetes installation, like don't pay the two thousand dollars you'll spend on a managed setup. Yeah, I mean, I would just enjoy it. Just I'm not even sure it's that much. Like yeah. the service, I think, is typically free. You pay for the instances. Yeah. Right. I don't know how Tecton. I mean, I don't know Tectonic's pricing model, but the one of the most interesting things about Tectonic. Uh, to me was basically the trusted boot um, stuff, if that's important to you. Uh, I'm gonna have trusted boot and rancher next year, I think. Yeah. Um, the uh, one thing that I want to bring up is kind of like, going back to your question about backups and everything. Um, one thing that we're kind of, maybe it's just me, um, super not used to thinking about segregating is we have what we think about as our applications and we have what we think about as our architecture right and our infrastructure that the architecture sits on and these days we also think about our platforms um, but it's really state management as soon as you drop data into any infrastructure now that infrastructure whether or not you call it immutable, you can call it cattle, you can call it whatever fun word you want to call it, as soon as you have put data into it, it is special. And so like, you almost need a full pipeline, full automation, uh, first class way of thinking about how you manage state in your system. Um, state makes everything special. And there are very few services, pieces of service software that don't deal with state that are also valuable. Um, so we all have it. It's all something that, <clears throat> it's something that we all have to think about. Um, but like, I would, I would really be careful about mixing the two things, like using infrastructure control mechanisms uh, to manage your state or to think about your state is, is kind of weird. You end up with the bleedy abstractions or using uh, you know, application control mechanisms like uh, deploying applications it, 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 that is also very strange. You can certainly use like AWS has a lot of really good APIs for like manipulating block stores, right? Actually taking snapshots of disk, like that's great. But I would recommend putting that as a something that has a completely different life cycle than your infrastructure as code. Um, because it's really easy to blow away everything with right. infrastructure as code. Right, right, and and there's something I didn't really talk about, which is, which you which you prompted me to, which you reminded me of. There are things that change more frequently um, than your infrastructure code. Like you may declare like, and then you have to be careful about things like. Um, in my in my security groups in particular, like uh, if I want to whitelist the points of ingress um, from like say CDN uh, points of presence like into my application, you know, so if you imagine your CDN, it's all around the world and uh, it's going to pull from the origin servers, and if you wanted to lock down uh, access from the CDN or to only be the CDN. Uh, servers making requests in, you want to make sure you understand like how often that set of points of presence actually changes. Um, 
you know, and anybody who's like whitelisted like access into the network from you know, say Sauce Labs or, or you know wherever or like a partner like is familiar with the problem. Um, what I'm suggesting is like be aware of like the impedance mismatches uh, that you might find there, um, or lifecycle mismatches that you might find there, um, because you might find that something changes much more quickly than your than than some of your base infrastructure code is, and like you might react to that and say like, well, okay, what I'll do is then I'll I'll make a lambda that is able to listen or find events and then like go change something. But now you've got this interesting thing where I'm managing like most of my security groups here and then some security groups over here. And this is an engineering, you have to figure out how to handle that from an engineering perspective. Um, but yeah, and, and definitely I, I will say that when you're doing infrastructure as code, be careful that you have those logical partitions in place because you can destroy things very efficiently and very quickly. <laughs> Careful and destroy, not forgiving. <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, create a, create a safe place to go and develop that stuff, right? And then you know, especially put the put controls around the data and the really important stuff, like whether that's multi-factor requirements on deleting an object in the object store um, or whatever. To, to kind of minimize like mistakes. So anyway, thank you uh, for coming. I hope you learned uh, lots of stuff and uh, feel free to come on up afterwards and actually have a few stickers and so forth up here. Um, I don't have as many llamas as I should have uh, brought, but uh, there are some DevOps llamas up here in the front. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>